Welcome back, it's Chris, and we are gonna get to head back on to 310 finally. Um, just been uh, checking things over, getting everything ready to go. I'm glad I did. One of the things I did was uh, thank you, Adam Seuss, for uh, pointing there, setting me on the track for these. Got all new head bolts. Um, these are ARPS bolts. I got them through Fast and All. Um, I can post the link down in the description. Let's see, I have a, well, these are the little lift bolts. There's, there's an old one. But as you can see, oh, just a skosh longer. Um, Adam has been using these in rebuilds. Uh, these are a, uh, what are they, a grade 12 or something. Whereas these are a grade eight. So a stronger bolt can take more uh, pulling, torque, or whatever. We're still gonna torque them to factory specs, but the, one of the bigger differences is, is look at, one of the bigger differences is, is look at the shoulder. Uh, this dock bolt, especially uh, in some spots, doesn't have that much of a shoulder. Whereas this has a much more significant shoulder. And you might say, well, what's the difference? You got a washer that goes under there, which I also got new washers, just because the uh, old ones can get distorted and crushed and whatnot. And there's a reason for that. So if you're looking for uh, washers, these are a Case IH part number, A58629. Just a heavy duty washer, pretty much identical to the originals. But what happens, let's take an original bolt here. Of course the head ain't, but um, this head is in pretty good shape as far as that area concerned. Actually, really good shape, but um, even with the that's the Robo washer. Okay. Even with the washer to spread out the load, most of the force goes on the inner edge of the washer, and so it kind of tries to cram down in the hole, and the cast iron will actually start crushing. I've seen ones where there's a concave shape to that. Well, if that gets concave shape from crushing down, you're also losing clamping force. So your head gasket ain't held as tight and it's more likely to leak. Adam says since he's been using these, uh, these ferry bolts from Fast and All um, with a larger shoulder, he has not had a head gasket failure. So, We can see that, uh, yeah, it's gonna hit that washer, but like I say, it's still gonna crush it, distort that washer. I mean, and then it's just a mess. So these just do a better, uh, better job because they're stronger bolts to start with. That might not seem like a huge difference in shoulder, but when you're Talking diameters and the little bit that's there, that's really spreading the load out more evenly across that washer, which then can spread the load more evenly across the head surface where it's touching. I you only have, there's 14 head bolts. You only need 13 because you still need the back one in the corner here is hollow because oil comes up through that to lubricate your uh, valve train. And that one takes less torque anyways, partially because it's hollow. I think that one only goes up to 130. The ones in the middle go up to 210. We'll get into that here in a little bit. So I will keep the stock one there. And then for now, I'm gonna put the two lifting eye bolts back in their respective spots just so I can move this engine around and stuff. And then once I have it in the tractor, I will pull them out one at a time and swap them out with the newer style bolts and then retain these for future use. Um, I could possibly chain to like the 
thermostat housing on the head here or something um but i just like lifting with those um it's nice because you got the reason they do two is the engine balances on the front one if you don't have the the uh, three speed on the back and then you want to move to this one yeah you move farther back if you got the three speed on and that helps it balance out it's got just a slight tilt to the back which is actually what you want so they make good lifting points i think a lot of i've worked on engines where like one's in the front and one's in the back and they must like hook a chain or an eye to them or something and don't realize of course you got to have the right lifting tool to thread onto those that is the plan i took each bolt when i Yes, I took each bolt and run it down a hole. Might as well take that off from there. And just to make sure the threads, they're brand new bolts, but just make sure there weren't nicked up threads or something that was going to hold up. They all threaded in good. So I just need to get these retainer bolts off that are holding the sleeves in place. Wipe everything down one last time. Make sure it's good and clean. And get her together. Well, thanks to Larry's Valak, I was able to procure a new old stock head gasket. Agco doesn't supply them anymore. There are alternatives, but I like this. Thought I'd set it on here, make sure all the holes line up good. Uh, Reliance has ga gaskets, and that seems to be their issue, is getting holes to line up. These are all lining up nice. Dowel pinholes in the right place for a turbo block. Copper crush washers on the uh, coolant passages here. Fire rings, the whole nine yards. It's looking good. I'm going to coat it with uh, Permatex copper spray, a gasket high temp seal it. Some uh, head gaskets will say right on them, use no sealant. And sometimes I find that's wrong and it, it, it works. <laughs> so use at your discretion. But I like it. They say it helps uh, seal a little better and helps transfer, improves heat transfer. Can't say I've done any research on that to verify that one way or the other. But it, uh, I like it. We did it back in the day. It seems like engines I do with it. I don't have any problem with seepage or anything. So that's the way it's going to be. There, got a good coat on it. Instructions say, uh, you know, don't overdo it and uh, allow it time to dry, get the solvent off so it cures. So while it's doing that, that can ran out. I've got another one. I might touch up a little bit after it dries a little more. A few thin spots. Let's talk about valve protrusion. I've double checked these and these are all good, but it makes a difference on how well these engines start as to how far these valves are below the surface of the head. And I mean sticking out from it, not down in that. So let me grab an old piston here. I guess to uh, you know, explain it good, yeah, I don't know how a diesel engine works. There's no spark plug. As this piston comes up to the top, it compresses the air. Compressed air gets hotter. The air gets hot enough that when the injector, which comes out of that hole right there, uh, sprays in the fuel, the air mixture is hot enough, it just starts burning. So when you're cranking over, it's move the piston's moving about as slow as it's ever gonna move. So it takes, uh, the faster it can compress that air, the, ho the hotter it's gonna be, because even with the ring gap being down to just a few thousandths, you know, 15 thousandths roughly on these, um, some of that compression can leak through there. That's where you get your blow by on your engine. And all engines have it to some degree. So if you're cranking slow, you lose your compression. You just don't build up the heat. It doesn't start. So fast cranking is important, but having good compression is important. Let's see, front is that away. Knock some of the soot off from there. So when this piston comes up, let me turn my screen. When this piston comes up, those valves actually, that's why there's these cutouts in the top of the piston. Notice if I try to turn it, it hits the valves. They sit down in those cutouts. Well, those valves are taking up air space. So that means the air gets squished down even farther, means more heat and easier starting. 
So if these valves are actually back in the head, that gap is more airspace, which means the air doesn't get squished as far, less heat, less likely to start. So that's uh, why valve protrusion is so important on these engines, just because of their design. They actually stick down there a little bit. There's still clearance there, so they don't hit, but um, they don't want them touching for obvious reasons. That valve can still be closing as this piston's, uh, well, on a compression stroke it wouldn't be, but exhaust stroke, the, uh, when it gets up to the top, the exhaust is just closing and the intake starts opening as this is right up here. Of course, the piston doesn't actually touch either. That's bad. Um, so you need the little gaps for that kind of stuff, which they've got that all figured in. And that's the story of valve protrusion. How much it sticks out of the head makes a difference. I think on both of them, the minimum is 14 thousandths. And I think um, exhaust has a little bit more than than the intake. I can put the service bulletin in this video. And um, that way you've got the specs. If you've got taking your head to a machine shop, make sure they get it right. So I'll wipe this surface off now that I've gotten soot and stuff on it and <laughs> make sure everything's good and clean. Looks clean. Head gasket in place. Some guide dowel, pins, bolts, whatever you want to call them. I think we're ready to drop this baby on and say goodbye to the pistons. Hopefully never see them again. Behave. Be good. slowly and there it is starting to look more like an engine well we want to lube these uh i'm just using the regular motor oil put a little under the don't want to get anything excessive where it's squeezing out and messing up the head gasket, but I want them lubed. Oh, let's see. Now, I know this one is not a lift bolt. And this one's not a lift bolt. Let's get the lift or the uh, lube bolt in its place. Just a 5 8 bolt with the head ground off. I use it a lot. I'm going to double check the book. Pretty sure they go in these two holes, the lift holes, lift bolts, but better safe than sorry. There's our torquing sequence. 
basically you work your way out from the middle and you don't want to do it all at once i'm going to start with um oh well, let's start with 35 foot pounds and we'll work our way up to the final torque um i don't know if this book has the uh, new updated it's one of the later books cylinder head uh -huh -huh -huh. Oh no, that would be under the last page, which is torque. Cylinder head cap screws, gasoline, um, yep. 210 on numbers 1 through 8, 11, and 12, and then numbers 9, 10, 13, and 14, which are basically your 9, 9, 10, 13, 14. You only go up to 130 on the ends. So this does have the latest um, earlier ones. I think it was, uh, I don't know, it was a little lower and they were having head gasket troubles and so they bumped it up. But we will work our way up in stages and while we're doing that, we're gonna try out, compare different torque wrenches, to see how uh, close they stay together. Try to keep it as scientific as possible, but. So let's start with, this one is, this one's still set for rods, so 45. Let's start with that. That's probably not a bad. Okay, let's just go back to what's the lowest this reads. Let's make it an easy to point at number on things, and we'll start with 40 foot pounds on everything. Because if you go full bore on one in the middle and the others are loose, you can distort things. So you want to ease into it. Um, one of the things that was holding me up getting this done was uh, trying to find a, I needed a 5 8 12 point. I've got an impact one coming, but we're going to abuse this Craftsman Chrome one and see how much torque it can take. Hopefully it'll last long enough to get this done. And then I got uh, the old lifting ones are still 6 point. Which that just kind of goes to show you the difference in, look how much washer is sticking out past that bolt versus that bolt. They are only running a 13 16 head on these stock uh, head bolts, even though they're a 5 8 bolt. So you got less surface area crushing down on that washer, so it distorts it, as opposed to that where the bolt covers pretty much the whole washer. So let's get at her. Like I say, we'll start with 40. I think what I'll do is start with the clicker one and do the whole thing with that and then double check them all with the other two and uh, see what it takes to get it to move again um, if this one's accurate at 40 once i get a little over 40 the bolt should turn just a little bit because it's got more torque same with this so let's let's find out I was just thinking, as I tighten these down, the others are going to get looser. So I almost need to double check them before I try the others, which I'll do. So let's see, one, two. Three. Yeah, see that one's loose already. Oops, I guess number four is this one. Click. Five. Eight. Eleven. Twelve. Thirteen. Okay, that's the first one, but I am willing to bet this probably takes a little bit to get back up to 40. 
just because the others are crushed. Yep. Yep. As you get closer to the outside, it takes less and less. Let me double check this one one more time. This one's going to be our guinea pig for the moment. Yep, clicked, didn't move. So it should be right about 40 foot pounds to get it to move. Took just a little over that. So let me check this one. Yeah, it's more around 42 when I feel it move. I will click this one again. The problem with the clicker is you can, when you click, you could be still pulling over. That's what I'm liking about that digital one. Okay, that clicked at 40. Oop, we hit 40. I need to go a little slower. There, it moved just a skosh. About 44.7. So, the uh, bar type was getting up around 45 when it would move. This one was right around 45, so my clicker is probably reading just a little low, if anything. But I like that these two are in agreement. Clicker ones, uh, there's a spring inside of here and you turn this up, it compresses that spring, so it takes more torque to make it click. Now that spring can get old, so these things do need calibrated. Making sure I got it set on a 40 and not something else. Yeah, it looks like it's right. So actually this is, this is going just a hair higher than what it was saying, because I had it set for 40. Both of those say we're saying about 45 when the bolt would start moving again. So they're pretty close. They do give a range on that stuff, but I like that digital one because I can see the numbers coming up and know when I'm getting close and not go over. For this, that probably ain't quite as crucial. It's the final torquing that really uh, really can, you know, you could overdo it on. All right. So this is number one. Three. Nine. Double check this one. Like I say, it's probably a little, just a little bit. We'll get this one. Yeah, about the same thing. A little bit over 80 to get it to start moving, which some of that might just be resistance to moving, you know, I, it's like rolling a car. Once it's moving, it's easier to go. It even works on this stuff. Got to overcome that initial drag. Oh, I got to set it up higher. Eighty-four point eight. So they're pretty darn close together. It's like I say, you figure out the initial uh, oomph to get it moving. I could feel it move and it only took just a couple extra foot pounds to move it more. So fortunately my clicker does go up to the 210 because this digital one only goes up to like 150. This only goes up to 150. But I have torqued these heads before with that clicker one and 
It seems to be consistent with the other two, so I'm confident of what I'm getting out of it. Now, since everything seems to be staying consistent, I'm gonna use the digital one. Let's bump up to, let's see, the final step for the ends is 130. Let's go 105. In honor of the white to 105. One hundred five point three. One hundred six. One hundred eight. Five point two, that's one hundred and five down the board. Let's take the next one up right up to one thirty. That'll be the end one's last turn. I'll double check them after I've done the middle because uh, they'll probably crush down a little bit. Might have to turn the heat down. <laughs> She's getting a mind of her own. 130. One thirty one point seven. Woo wee. Yeah, my brother stopped by and we were chatting while I was doing the final torque, so that won't be in here. But um everything's at two ten, other than the ends are at one thirty, just like the book calls for. And double checked them after I was done. That just takes a little bit of a strong arm. So now I'm trying to decide. I think I'm gonna put the injectors in just so that's one less uh, opening that goes into the combustion chamber. I could throw the valve cover over here to keep this stuff out of here. Um, just always trying to do stuff to keep foreign material from going into the engine. So yeah, I think uh, I'll pop the injectors in. I might show one in this video, but I'm gonna have a whole separate video on uh, putting the injection pump on, timing it. And um, until I get the flywheel on, I can't time it good anyways. So be watching for that in the future. But I, once I have all the pieces of that video recorded, then it'll, it'll end up uh, being on. So let's do that. I bought new injectors. These are Stanodynes, not aftermarket. And nice thing is they come with a carbon dam installed, the white ceiling ring there, because uh, getting that on kind of stretches it and then you kind of have to wait for it to go back down or whatever. And then there's this ring, the ceiling ring for the top. So I've put a little engine oil on there just to help it slide in a little better. Here's the seal that goes up top, which is already on there. And if I put it in the right hole, Give it a little wiggle as it goes in, it slides right down. Get this clip on there. The spacer that goes underneath it. This clip comes with the injector, and then you got your other hold downs and stuff that you need to save from your previous one. My experience was in the past, and I still hear the same thing now, is that these inje pencil style injectors just aren't really worth rebuilding. There we go, if we get it in the right spot, it goes in. Um, they can be done, but you're probably just as far ahead to uh, buy new ones for what it costs to rebuild the old ones. And 
possibly a little bit lower performance than fresh. I am not going to tighten these bolts until the lines are all on. That gives me just a little bit of wiggle room to help get the nuts started. And then once the nuts are started, then I'll tighten these down. Let's get some valve train on there. Now you may notice I've got fuel stuff on. That is gonna be a separate video. I'm not skipping over it, but I just wanna put it all together. So if someone's just working on fuel, they don't have to dig through another video to find what they need. I had to double check the 1955 and the parts book. There are two studs that are longer than the rest, which is what I've got. And they're both to support the air cleaner. One goes in the back hole, one goes in the, what would basically be the fourth hole from the front. One, two, three, four, yep. And then the other four are all the same length. I'm gonna wire brush these off just a little bit, make sure they're good and clean. And we'll get them in there. I guess I can go down a little bit more. I've often seen where guys drive the studs down in too far, screw them in, I guess would be the right thing to say. And then there's hardly any sticking through. This is gonna be up a little bit higher, more like that with the gasket in. So there's room to thread them in just a little bit farther, but I've seen them threaded in so far that the uh, there's barely any nut engagement. So you don't want to overdo it, but yeah, I'll get them in a little bit farther. If you've been watching this from the beginning, you'll maybe remember that uh, the valve cover that was on it was cracked. Fortunately, I have a parts engine for that's uh, been very handy for this, and it appeared to have a good uh, valve cover on it. It's black, so I'm wondering uh, a little bit of green showing on it. I don't remember if the 283, like in a 1655, takes the same valve cover. It, it might. I guess I don't know that answer for sure. It's a good idea to just lay them on a good flat surface and roll them back and forth. And if they're bent at all, you'll you'll feel a wobble in them. These all seem good. There were uh, I got some out of that used engine I was talking about because there was a lot of rust in the upper end of this one. These are just cleaner. But there was a couple of those that were bent. And so, fortunately, uh, I only had to grab one out of the old one. You can see some of the pitting. It's still going to work, but... Let's get them in there. Put a little assembly lube on the bottom chip here just to so I ain't sitting in there dry This is also from that parts engine. Uh, Alan wire brushed it, took the whole assembly apart, cleaned it up. And uh, boy, there was just a lot of pitting in there when I put it back together. I think it's still usable, but this one was better. 
I guess I'll save that for another project and use the best stuff I've got for this one. Because who knows, maybe there won't be another project. And I wish I had uh, used the good stuff on this one. But uh, that's the way it's going to be. I like to do it a little at a time so I don't bend that rod in the middle. You got all these different, you know, springs pushing against everything. The front's pretty much down. Of course, that's pretty close to top dead center, so I know it's off a little, but the valve should be closed, so there's nothing holding that up. Okay, now we need to set the valves. I say it's pretty close to number one being on top dead, but I know I turned it some putting that front pulley on. There, that should be TDC. I can see they're close enough for setting the valves. You stay on there. Number six exhaust is closing and intake is starting to open, so that means uh, this is on top dead center compression or ignition. So now I have to look in the book, see what it's supposed to be set at, and uh, set it. Valve clearance is 30 and 30 on both. Oop, that's tight. I mean, it's not tight tight, but it's, it's less than 30. Oops, let's see. Just a little bit of drag, just the way I like it. And this one's got too much. That's pretty good. I'll have to redo them after I, after I fire it up and run it. By the book, you're supposed to run it for 30 minutes at temperature, and then while it's still hot, retorque the head, which is what I plan on doing. And retorquing it will squeeze things down. You set these cold, so then I'll let the engine cool off, and then I'll double check these one more time because they'll probably be off a little bit from the retorquing. So, one five, so I need to watch number two. There. Too tight there, too tight there. Very tight. Which, with new valves and everything, it could be pretty much any which way. Get on there. That's good enough for that one. Good enough. I want to be 
watching number four. There. That one ain't too far off. Three, six, so now we gotta watch number one. Two, four, so I need to watch five. Four, so I need to watch number three. There, that should be good enough for the initial, um, you know, firing up and everything. Let's get her back on top dead center for number one. I gotta clock this elbow right and get the uh, lube line in for the rockers. There, that line is in. It's better if it's not touching anything so it doesn't wear through. This one is seems to be fine. I can now put the gasket on the valve cover. I am done under there for now until after it's time to retorque it. And get the manifolds on. What I like to use is uh, this yellow 3M weather strip adhesive just on the valve cover side. That'll really hold that gasket in place. And since the cover's gotta come off again, I don't even do anything with the other side. I guess I could put a little grease on it. But um, this stuff usually takes just to, helps if you let it dry just for a couple minutes. Then the gasket's definitely gonna stay with the cover. It's gonna stay lined up with the cover. It's gonna seal up good. I can pull it back off by only doing one side for when I retorque the head. It's good stuff.